Hi, this is Glenn Kaiser, and we're here with the Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection Oscars Contenders podcast series. And I'm thrilled to be here in Burbank at the Warner Brothers stages with the team that's nominated uh, on Joker. Uh, some old friends here at the table with me, Alan Murray, who's nominated for uh, Best Sound Editing on the movie. You're the supervising sound editor on the film. Yes. Morning, morning. Morning, morning. And uh, we're joined by Tom Ozanich and Dean Zapanzik, who were the re-recording mixers on the film and nominated for Best Sound Mixing. Congratulations, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. And before we start, I should point out that uh, Todd Maitland is also uh, nominated on the film. He was the, uh, the production sound mixer. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, great, uh, great work all around. So I wanted to kind of you, you guys know you guys have worked together quite a bit. I feel like it was just not too long ago that we had a conversation about a Star Is Born on our on our on our podcast series, and then of course you know Alan. I think this is you know you've made multiple appearances over here. I remember I think you were on our, our, our first or second season talking about your nomination for Sicario. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We had it at the hotel. That's right. Yeah. That's that's right. Right after the nominees launch, it was a little it was a little boozy that afternoon. Yeah. We had a, yeah. We had a we had a really good time, but this is your so you've this is your your, your ninth nomination uh tenth your tenth nomination the internet is wrong ladies <laughs> and gentlemen your tenth nomination and you've won previously twice yes uh, for american that, sniper yeah. and uh letters, letters from letters from iwo jima yeah. right and you guys obviously you were all nominated together for a, a star is born right right, right. so uh i just want to dive right into the movie because i think there's a there's a lot to unpack with joker <laughs> Um, you know, right from the opening logo, you know, uh, director Todd Phillips, you know, starts the movie with the, the, the classic, you know, 1970s uh, Saul Bass version of the Warner Brothers logo. And then, you know, you go into that first scene with Arthur Fleck, uh, who is not the Joker yet, but will be the Joker at some point soon in the film. And he's in, his, you know, he's in, uh, it's that dressing room scene and he's getting, you know, getting ready to perform as a, as a, a very creepy clown. <laughs> so, but you guys set a tone, right? And I'm always interested in the first few minutes of the, of the, of the film and how the director is deciding to, where to start the story and, and how to get the audience into this because, you know, you realize very quickly on, this is not a typical DC right. superhero movie. So talk to me about that first few minutes and what's happening and how you guys worked with director Todd Phillips to set the tone of the film. Tom did that quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we literally started off the dub, you know, with Todd saying, uh, we are going to be mixing this scene until the very last day of the dub. This is going to be the hardest scene in the movie. And he was right. Um, which is really funny because it's not the most complex, you know, scene in terms of all that's going on. But but it is really tricky scene uh, because of the setup and there isn't like a super clear point of focus right. um, as it kind of leads in. And so really that's all told to you by the sound and, and how that kind of leads you through that scene. And so we, we had lots of different versions that we went through. There was a point where we had you know, uh, a source cue playing, a Neil Young song was playing in the background that kind of went through there. We had a score in there for a little while. We played up, you know, what if we play the radio down real low? Mm -hmm. What if we play it up more? And we really played with all these different um, levels and placements and everything. And, you know, what we kind of decided was that we really needed to have this intricate balance where you become aware of different things happening in the scene um and you know i kind of always think of it as it's like a baton that you're sure. handing off and, and sound really leads you to what to focus on in a scene by the baton kind of continually handing off to right. the next thing and so you, you kind of start tracking in there like say the low old logo comes right. up and you're zooming in and it's very kind of small in the beginning and it opens up into that world and you hear the clowns the other guys you know talking off to the side and you kind of hear them percolate up and down sometimes so that you're aware of them but they're not the main focus the radio really kind of becomes that because uh because people talking yeah and so you automatically focus in on that but once we get to sort of the camera landing on Arthur, 
we needed to figure out a way to sort of allow your focus to shift onto him and what is he doing and you know kind of like delve into there a little bit of what's going on in this guy's head you yeah. know and um so I, I you know there was a lot of intricate foley work that was done there just to hear the brushes that he's doing sure. and um we actually had no production sound <laughs> for that that we could use and so we cobbled together some breathing and stuff from Joaquin from other things and and did some other stuff where Todd actually got on a mic and did some sort of mouth sounds mm -hmm. and little movement things because we really wanted to feel like, you know, we're really close it's to It's really him. intimate sounding. Yeah. And we needed to have the presence of him, but we had to kind of manufacture that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, it's all, the breathing's really walking and all that. It's just sure. taken from somewhere else. But you were having to construct all that out. Yeah. There. And we needed to shift the radio in such a way that those, it didn't feel like you were, you know, turning it down a bunch or something because we're actually getting closer to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it works that you really, you get close to him and, and because he's so imposing on the image visually, and then you hear all those little details of him. I think you just, you focus in on him. And even though the radio is still there, it, it tucks back a little bit. And, and we, the city sounds kind of drift away. Yeah, right? all that stuff goes away and you're really focused on him. And then the scene ends after his smile and yeah. it takes you off into the next. But prior to getting to him, we, we on the stage with Todd, the whole scene is rhythmic, sonically, and it was very important how we got rhythms of horns, rhythms of the the card playing, the the, the dialogue going, the card playing. Nothing really, things got on top of each other, but it was all very strategically placed to get the right rhythm with the camera move. And, and we, it took a long time to figure out because you feel you you felt not at ease in a bad way. Yeah, it wasn't right. working. And that's right. Well, I think it, I, I'm glad you said that because it was something I I really responded to in the film right away. And from that very first sequence, you understand that that sound is going to be used in this film to give you the experience of this character, Arthur Fleck. And it's one of the things that I I really love about sound when it's really working well is it's a very powerful tool for the director to use to put the audience in the experience of the of the main character and mm -hmm. you know right away from that first sequence like spending time in arthur fleck's head is not going to be a pleasant experience <laughs> yeah. right yeah yeah and that was one of todd's directives from the beginning was i want you to feel like you're there with arthur so we did tons of work with the atmos and ambisonic mics and and tried to make the audience feel that they were always sitting in the middle of this with Arthur right so yeah yeah it was a quite a intricate mix and a lot of uh, trial and error too so, oh yeah, yeah exactly did you get you guys had uh, a, a good amount of time on the mixing stage to experiment and play and figure out what was gonna work Lisa yeah. Dennis our post supervisor really was instrumental in getting us the time we needed that she felt we needed and that Todd would have been comfortable with. Well, because it's interesting, Tom, what you said, you know, it doesn't necessarily sound like it's this, you know, you're not aware as you're listening to it, like mm -hmm. this is a very, but, you know, looking at the film a second and a third time, then you become aware of like the layers mm -hmm. and, and the time that you spend buys you that ability to get very specific, right? Mm -hmm. which oh, yeah. I really like about, the, yeah. you know, everything was super articulate, you know, there was, this was not a muddy track right. at all, even though there's a lot going on. Yeah. And if we didn't have the time to do that, you wouldn't be able to build that much depth to the layers just because, you know, you don't have time to dial all that in. But we did, like Dean was saying, we had a couple of weeks to do the first temp mix, which, you know, we all really believed and, and Lisa, you know, supported and, and even she was the one who uh, spearheaded that, that let's start on a really good footing, right? you know? And um, and we did that, and and it was a huge benefit because then we were really building on something solid um, going forward into 
another temp or two. I don't remember how many we did. Well, uh, you know, our, our audience for this podcast, there's a lot of professionals who listen in as well as a lot of, you know, students and, and film fans. So, the, you know, we, we do like to get a little granular sometimes about about, about the process. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit. So you mentioned, so you, you had a, about a two-week temp, temp mix and then... Uh, you, you guys were able to keep that material up to date and not have to reinvent everything as you kept going through the process. And then w about how much time were you pre-mixing and, and, and final mixing? Probably another two and a half, three weeks for pre-dubs. Yeah. Like the final mix. And then the final yeah. was, it was probably all told, it was uh, not counting the temp. Mm -hmm. It was probably a nine week dub that's a great schedule it was it was fantastic and even we, months before the temp alan and his crew which by the way those guys did a great job the sound editors um they built full out real one and two which was the setup and then the the um the subway real the, two the, the, the subway, subway scene is in real two correct yeah, yeah. yeah. they built out and then Alan and I spent some time getting Real One to a manageable spot, presentation-wise. Brought Todd in, so Todd could hear the direction Alan was going right. in, sonically for Gotham. Right. We played him all of Real One. He was happy with everything mostly, and then gave Alan specific notes that he built on prior to us getting into the temp. Yeah. So we really had a thought process going in and a foundation built. Yeah. Even prior to the temp. Yeah. So the temp was treated kind of more of like a, a, a final. Little, a little, a mini final. Right. Oh, yeah. And and Todd was so into the soundtrack. I mean, he fought it at first because he's not a happy guy spending all day on the dubbing stage. But right. nobody is. So he finally got into it and realized what he could do with uh, placing sounds in different uh, fields of the uh, the theater and all that. and. So for the first temp mix, we actually did final Foley. We had all the elements. Wow. So he could experience it and listen to it and say, yeah, that's that's what I felt that should sound like. So he, he had a complete uh, mix scape in his mind from day one. So, that's great. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you mentioned, you know, the sound of Gotham. And I want to I want to talk about that because uh, I think it's a really important sonic element of, of the film. Obviously, you know, Arthur Fleck is a pretty, you know, disturbed, unhappy guy in a very dark environment. And it, it's, you know, it, it, it made me think a lot about like New York City, New York City in the, in the 1970s and what a kind of like a, a just a tough environment that was. And can you talk a little bit about how you you use sound to evoke that uh, about uh, that kind of feeling, that kind of darkness in, in the environment? Well, the initial instruction was it's got to be a city on edge and we're going to build it all the way through the show. So until you get to the big riot until you get to the rioting so in order to do that you know we had to bring in aggressive horns big v8 engine right. sounds lots of buses uh we came up with specific sirens for gotham just to keep the viewer uh aware that the city was always alive yeah uh we did adr out on the new york street back here and had record us up on five stories uh, recording down and we shot ADR for the whole city back there. There were tons of call outs oh, so that let Tom me, so, did. So you, guys, yeah. so you guys brought a loop group in yes. and you did here on the back lot at Warner Brothers. Yeah. You went outside and recorded so that you could get sounds bouncing off of buildings, buildings. and that kind of reflections and stuff. Yeah, and the depth too. I mean, we had guys up on the rooftops and all that. So that gave Tom an easier time of he had multiple tracks, you know, street level rooftops, so he could pick and choose which one worked the best for him. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I, one of the things I really uh, loved about the movie is is um, the way you guys handled the 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 sound inside Arthur's apartment, um, because you know normally we kind of think like home is the sanctuary, the safe place that you go to, and you can kind of relax and let let go of the world, but sonically you guys didn't let arthur do that mm -hmm. and his, tell me a little bit about his apartment and how you how you made that sound i was actually just describing it as i think he's his apartment is kind of like his cocoon right but those walls are thin and there's a, a big nasty world outside that's just kind of you know banging on his doors 
and you're always kept aware of that by all the stuff Alan was just talking about being there. You're still hearing all this stuff, people yelling outside his windows, you know, constantly through the walls, arguments happening. It's all pretty negative stuff for yeah. the most Edgy part. Vibe, yeah. yeah, it just contributes to that sense of like unease, right? Yeah. 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 We also had direction from Todd, which was uh, really great specifics on where we were in any one building, mm -hmm. meaning our th he would give us, uh, one of our notes was the uh, psychiatrist's office. That's on the sixth floor outside a busy Gotham Street. Uh -huh. Arthur might be on the second floor of the apartment building, but where the bathroom is is a courtyard, so you don't hear much of the street. So we had very specific Oh, that's interesting. Places to you place had, You sound. had real war rules for this world. Well, yeah. because yeah. because oh, yeah. then to, to, uh, to, to then Alan would build accordingly, and then Tom and I would have to. You you just didn't put a delay or a reverb on all exterior sounds. You had an idea where they lived, so you'd varied reverb delay times. Sure. And and if they're interior, exterior, whatever, depending on what we visioned, sixth floor would be second floor 10th floor mm -hmm. so todd knew how important it was sonically gave us those notes which were tremendous because if we didn't know you sure. just kind of wing it if yeah. you will so we made this plan okay if we're on second floor this is how this would sound because we're closer to the street uh, the walls are thin mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was great direction that gave us the freedom to play it yeah yeah, which is well. It's interesting because you know, obviously, the audience is not necessarily going to clue into that. But when and you they build, shouldn't. but I mean, when they you shouldn't build, consciously think about, they that. shouldn't consciously be aware of it. But but when when you as as filmmakers and storytellers build a world that has that much detail and consistency, you know, that has an effect on the audience. Yeah. Well, it does because think about it. Uh, it's not unlike an actor who builds his or her That's character. Right. That's right. So if the audience is watching the movie. And you get taken out because oh, that guy yelling doesn't sound like he's, yeah. you know, hey, shut up, if, where they're <laughs> pounding on. And that doesn't sound real. Then you're taken out of the the, the scene momentarily, and it, and, and then you're, you, it takes you that much longer to get back up to speed to believe sure. in the movie again. So if we drop the ball at all, sonically, the reality of what's happening is lost for yeah. an, an instant or the whole time. But you guys took interesting opportunities to kind of to get a little subjective and a little abstract with the sound as well, just to kind of reinforce that sense of right. disturbance. Like, tell me, I I'm, I know I know about the door to Arthur's yeah. apartment. So can you can you tell that story? Yeah. Well, the initial rules were always we're real, we're in reality, and our soundscape builds with and mirrors what Arthur's going through uh, in his conflicts. So as things get tougher for Arthur in specific scenes, we ratchet up the abrasive sounds. Uh, in instance, for the subway, you know, it started off a normal subway train ride. Right. And then the lights start flickering and the more breaks, more low wind creeps into the subway. And it's a kind of a subliminal thing to the audience, like, okay, this is getting really sinister. Yeah. And then we do, you know, process roller coaster buys and and jet engine buys for the trains you on put the jet engines in the train bus. yeah just to <laughs> give that that abrasive edge yeah. and things the, the notes from todd were make things off kilter as mm -hmm. crazy as what's going in in arthur's head so back to the door yeah <laughs> we the door was normal up until arthur put on the makeup and then right. the two clowns came to visit him and all of a sudden the door had this twilight zone sinister creek to it and that's how we kind of built each scene it was built like a symphony as as the scene gets more intense the sounds get more sinister and so, yeah yeah more little instruments become yeah part of the symphony if you will yeah and i, I love that i love that too because of course I, like as we were talking before the audience is not gonna well, quite frankly, if the audience realizes like oh the sound of the door changed then something's gone wrong already right, right? right. but but it, they feel it 
right? Yeah. Um, so you brought up the subway scene. So I, I'm, I'm glad you did because I want to unpack that a little bit and talk about that because it's really, it's really kind of a, kind of a, a big centerpiece of the film and really the moment when he, that's when he becomes Turns. Joker, yeah, right? Exactly. So you, you talked about, um, you, you talked about the, 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 the way you use sound effects to kind of escalate that scene. But the other thing that I noticed was, you know, I think uh, a lot of other directors might have said, "Well, I'll use music in this in this." situation to kind of heighten the tension but Todd went a different way so talk about that sequence a little bit well we were always conscious of Hilder's incredible score because we had that from day one most of it it got refined as the mix went on but we were always aware of her her tonal things that she had brought so we had from the beginning with Todd in conjunction we had decided how we were going to weave in and out of the uh, score with sound effects and vice versa. So Todd would pick a scene and say, okay, we're going to start with sound effects and then we're going to creep in the music here or the music would start the scene and the sound effects would come later. So we did quite a bit of trial and error on building the scene. Mm -hmm. So again, it was starting in reality and as things get ugly, things get more sinister. Now you would either do that with sound effects, backgrounds, or the scores. So, yeah. Yeah. And it was all well planned. Todd. Yeah. Todd. That, that score of that, when, that well, when, those, <laughs> when those channels come in. Yeah. yeah. We're talking about Hilder uh, Gunnadotter's score, yeah. which she just won the uh, the Golden Globe it's for so, it. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of work. It is. Yeah. Um, Tom, can you talk a little about, because you're, you're responsible for, as the, you're the dialogue and music mixer. Right. So can you, you're responsible for kind of finding that balance between Alan's sound effects and, and Hilder's score. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of navigating that path? Yeah. Um, and, you know, in that particular scene, well, first of all, let me take a step back. Um, I had, I think it was 120 tracks or something, sort of an A, B of the score. That you had 120 tracks of score? Yeah. Um, it's not all constantly going the whole time. Uh -huh. um, most of that is so that you can like have a piece of score tail into another piece of score and you I can see. A, B it. In this particular case of that scene, that particular cue gets big enough that it spills into the sort of B side. But I see, I see. Okay. But um, uh, we had kind of worked out a uh, uh, deliver it in this such a way so that when I'm mixing in Atmos, I can really get to all the parts and really spread that around and um, get in and do some detail work. And, um, you know, I did a lot to try to really work on bringing out the, the details of, like, say, the cello, being able to hear, you know, the bow across the, the strings and hear that resin just edge, you know, um, and so, so the music came to you in such a way it had been mic'd that you had all that detail. Yeah, in, in, I mean, there's the some things I did to, you know, sort of some distortion things and whatnot to try to bring that out a little bit more. Because sure. once you put all that stuff in, effects wise, the trains and all that, you're gonna lose some of that. So I'm trying right. to emphasize it a little bit so that it cuts through. Um, but. Yeah, it just builds, and we wanted to have the score just emerge out of the cacophony of all the train stuff going on. And so it's that particular cue starts with this kind of rumble and sort of stuttery, you know, stuff going on, and then pops out and starts to become really big and over the top. And we went back and forth trying to sort of sort out okay, we need to hear this part, so let's carve out some low end here. Let's let, you know, this have it. Music has it for this moment. And then, you know, one of the big really climaxes in that sequence is actually the cut outside to the walkway and the train coming by. That's and it's right. just this huge low end of the train and everything. So that was where, you know, I'm like carving out to let that happen. And then we go back in and we have this theme that plays as Arthur is kind of right. reeling and spinning from what just happened and trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to have all the parts and be able to play with panning those parts around and, um, you know, a little bit of movement in that stuff really allows it to cut through better even when there's a lot going right. on. And so, um, and then, you know, 
the train stops and it all kind of settles down and then we get really intimate with you know the terror of the that's right leading up to you know shooting the guy on the steps um and of course then you know go off to running down the street and in the bathroom which then becomes very much in his head right and and that's um, a big music moment as well Mm -hmm. big music moment there's you know some great effects in there that are just super detailed so that it's there and it's supporting what you're seeing you hear him breathing you hear his feet a little bit you hear the lights flickering but all of that is subservient to that piece of music and his dance and yep. and it makes that, you that very very disturbing yeah it dance. makes you more <laughs> disturbed because yeah. you feel that intimacy you know and, and there were some times when I wasn't sure if I was hearing sound effects or I was hearing music. That's what which I found really interesting. Yeah, and we we've had experience with uh, Johan Johansson, who right. Hilder was with. So I've worked with them on Sicario. On Sicario, which was an of... iconic score. Yeah. The music so the yeah, we we learned early on how to blend in and out with the music and not be. Somebody would go, oh, that's sound effects, that's music. You couldn't tell. So we had set that up earlier, knowing what kind of score that they usually do. So Those crazy yeah. Icelanders, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys brought up Dolby Atmos, and of course, this is the Dolby Institute podcast, so I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't let that go without diving into that a little bit. You, I mean, and honestly, the the track that you guys did, you know, for A Star Is Born, for for us, you know, at the company, is still kind of that's that's a just an extraordinary example of what artists can do with this tool. Oh yeah, you know, and specifically on on that film with Bradley Cooper, you know, the the work that you guys did, especially I'm thinking on the you know, the the performance scenes when, you know, you used Atmos to really put yourself on that stage and you had drums behind you and the crowd in front of you and then you just perspective shifts and overheads and all that was really just amazing. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you guys used Atmos on on this film to build Arthur's world and to balance it with the music, as you said? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan and lover of Atmos. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think... I don't know if I've done anything that's not Atmos for five years or something, you know. Uh, I am always trying to convince everybody you have to do this. Um, And uh, in in this particular case, um, that was, uh, you know, there's a little bit of dialogue that's using it, um, not a ton, but like um, there's a few places the group uses it, you know, crowd things and stuff like that. Um, but I used it a lot for the music. Um, and and that was you were able to do that because you had that amount of separation on the instruments. And exactly. so exactly. So how were you positioning stuff in the in the sort of the 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 Atmos field with the with the music? Um, well, I had pretty broken out elements. Um, from them and uh, I really tried to build something that kind of blooms from the front back and kind of washes over you most of the time Um, and you know depending on the scene and the situation you know there's times when I'm using that to give us clarity apart from effects things that might be more densely taking place on the screen Um, I also really wanted to make it so that there was a uh, a little bit of a separation um, from the reality of Gotham and Arthur's world and and that being really stuck to the screen and but yet we're in it and it's still wrapping around us and then have the score be something that's like a little bit more beautiful, mm-hmm. really, um, because that's all in his head. I mean, the score for this movie um, is basically always scoring him, right. you know, and his feelings and his where he's at. So um, it has the freedom to uh, to not be as attached in that way. Right. And and the Atmos really allowed it to to get that clarity and just kind of immerse you in that. Um, there's lots of 
source cues and things also in the movie and songs that play as score to source or vice versa. Um, So, you know, there are music elements that are played in a similar way to the effects and the dialogue of being rooted in the reality, you know, Um, but... Yeah, and Dean, what about uh, what about Atmos on the effects side? What were you what were you do, what were you doing on, over on your part of the console with it? Before I get to that, <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say to to, to the point with the music, um, because the music was so rich, low end wise, the full range surrounds just helped right. immensely mm-hmm. with that huge cello, and gave us gave Tom the opportunity to play the the cello in various spots and you're not losing the energy or you're not losing the effect of it which is brilliant yeah and also in the murray franklin show when joker's behind the curtain doing his dance before he goes out we actually have hilder's cello up front in the surrounds we have a totally different piece of music which is a, a choir which is what is is that is that the show is that the show music or is that you know, no it has elements? nothing to do with Murray Frank. we had an actual choir that moves across behind you when Arthur's out there doing his weird dance before prior he goes to on going the show. out right two totally separate pieces of music but Tom was able to blend them into a, a, a really cool environment so yeah and that just again it just puts the audience just kind of off balance oh yeah, yeah. well I think that. Uh, since we touched that scene <laughs> yeah please <laughs> I, uh that's one of my favorite i guess i have a lot of favorite parts of this movie but yeah. that's one of them because um the way that we treated it um the score is playing a really unique uh role there so we're you know to clarify what the scene is is it's the scene where uh at, towards the end of the movie where arthur is waiting behind the curtain to go out on the Murray show. And so all of the sound that's happening in the real world is the Murray show. Is the Murray show right? like muffled behind this curtain. It's happening, right. it's happening out there. Yeah. Um, but I really wanted to play that like it's happening, it's there, but Arthur doesn't really care about that. Uh-huh. He, he's already made up his mind of what why he's, he's there and nothing that's happening over there right now matters or is a part of that. So even though it's happening, the balance of how that score plays against, uh, you know, Robert De Niro out there talking and and the audience reacting and all that is played in such a way that you understand that it's not that important. And there's this score that is playing Arthur and his head and you kind of buy that and you're kind of with him, even though this, Big thing is way more activities happening right there. And we do cut into that space even yeah. a couple of times. Um, but I just love the juxtaposition of that because to me, I think that's not normal. You know, we wouldn't normally play it that way. We would normally you'd be like, oh, no, we need to hear what, you know, it's he's a big saying show. out right. there. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he's just sitting here waiting. So what's the big deal? But but there's a lot going on in his head right then. So so many comments. I'll get back to the. I'll get to the sound <laughs> no, no, effects no, no. in a second. I'm, I'm, but, I'm, this is a great conversation. Please, dude, but please so go. many comments from people in the business, yeah. from from friends of ours who are actors, who are just went to see the movie as actors. Sure. To watch the performance right. come out. Holy moly! Yeah. The sound was so much a part of the character. So, but. Um, Part of the fun that we had with this movie, you really don't know what is reality and what is Arthur's head. Mm-hmm. So to this point, we're in Arthur's head here, but we're not, it's not being so obvious. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not saying it, but we are with the, with, with the mix. But again, the audience knows something's just off. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you right. buy into it and you're in your for from the beginning of that logo all the way through, you're in it. Yeah. And and I, I love the opening of this movie because it sets us up like we're gonna watch, uh, you know, a '70s kind of movie, yeah. Serp- an iconic Dog 70s Day Afternoon, movie. Serpico, right. or something like you know, those, one it, of those really tough '70s, exactly. Dirty, and you, you just know. go for it, and you're in it. So, so the sound effects, 
we did the obvious airs and and but in atmos and backgrounds and room tones and stuff like that where the room tones shift from being all over outside to being very intimate inside interior sounds but also as arthur starts to go into his psychosis things kind of change mm -hmm. atmospherically right. too and um but also atmos just afforded us to place those horns and those calls in various spots and uh two one or two of my favorites sonic is the quietness outside um uh arthur goes to uh bruce wayne the the wayne manor and it's so quiet it's so it's different. the only calm exactly <laughs> acoustically when he goes to wayne manor it's the only calm moment in the film right, right? and it's just so serene and yeah. so we got to play a little bit we had a big discussion about crickets <laughs> <laughs> so we got to play some crickets because we weren't sure if it's it's dusk but is it winter and so right. we had a bit that that we went down that kind of discussion road and but you just hear some air and the air is behind us and just nice little subtleties uh the murray franklin show the audience that gave us a point sure. to play the audience especially when that camera does the whip around and we atmos just you just feel it and todd you're in the space the, the first time he saw it was like oh that's so cool that was that he's doing you know, did the audience go around with the camera? Yeah, it was. And yeah. He, so he, he he loved that and and um, that yeah, was, well, yeah. Once he dialed into that, he really started to get into that and start going, "Well, can't we do this?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had he worked in Atmos before? He, I don't, I don't think so. No, yeah. I mixed War Dogs with him, and I don't think that. And this is also just a very different kind of movie for yeah, yeah. for Todd mm -hmm. Phillips as well. Right? Yeah. But we also had Todd Maitland, a production mixer, who lives in New York. Right. Uh, we had decided, since we're going to be in the middle of everything, that we needed a full surrounds 360 and com and company soundtrack for this movie. So we got an Amazonic mic and sent it back to Todd, who then went out and shot late night on the subways and, and shot in the tenements and in the streets. So... And the ambisonic mic captures a, a 360 sound yeah, environment, right? Which totally helped us with Atmos. We didn't have to uh, dream up different things to do. The, it was all there for us. You had a framework at, there at, already. Yeah, and the framework. So yeah, yeah. Another Atmos moment that we don't really talk about, which is a cool moment, is when we go into the when we're we're downstairs prior to the comedy club, prior to him going. Upstairs, up those stairs, doing his stand up, right? Uh -huh. And the audience and and the guy on stage is on. He's on stage, but he's also on that TV set, and the TV set swings around. Right. We, and then we're going down that little hallway, and and yeah. It, what's it, funny about that is when we first started working on that scene, we didn't totally understand the geography of the scene. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because no. We didn't pan it yet, so nobody had done that work. And you're looking at it, and it's like, wait a minute, is he going that direction or is he going this direction? And it was a little bit confusing. And once we figured out the geometry, geography of it, I mm -hmm. mean, um, it was like, oh, okay, let's do this. And we started panning things to really tell you, oh, he's down the hallway, he turns around, he comes back into this room, this right. TV goes off, he's going up the steps. and. I think that really is a great example of how the sound is is completely telling you where you are and what's happening in Helping a way that had that not yeah, happened, yeah. You, you would be very confused if it played very, you know, just sort of typical right, right. mono dialogue in the middle. Yeah. And, um, and it goes through multiple transitions, you know, because of he walks through multiple rooms and up the stairs and then onto the stage and... But that's even, just a great sequence that it's not chaotic like the subway so people overlook it but there's so much detail there's so much going but on I, I love it when artists like you guys use atmos to get specific like that right and to and to just play sounds really carefully i mean everybody gravitates toward like the riot scene or the sub you know these right. big right. moments of a lot of chaos and stuff going on but i love that just those super articulate moments yeah, right and it gives us the freedom to do that but to feel the breath of everything. And that scene, there, there's really good dialogue work yeah. in that scene because when Arthur's standing at the curtain 
waiting for the guy to introduce him. And the guy's off, he's on the mic, but you hear the room mic sound mm -hmm. and whatnot. And then the camera, Arthur's POV, turns to see his girlfriend sitting. The dialogue work just shadely goes away, the mix of the dialogue. So now the viewer is looking at, so now we're aware that she's there. Or is she? Correct. <laughs> exactly. But he and, believes but she's there. Right, right, but she's but he believes she's there. Yeah. But and, and we, we as the audience at that point believe you, you she's that's there right, as well. That's right, so. that's right. And then he introduces Arthur and he goes out and we're we're in that in that zone now. But that's great. I love that scene. Well we were we were laughing about it, but uh I think, you know, to your point, you you, you were talking about this, the way you guys use sound to uh kind of you know, we don't know if we're seeing something that's real or if it's Arthur's tortured mental state. One of my favorite scenes in the film is when he's rehearsing to go on onto the onto the, the the Murray Franklin show. Can you talk about that scene a little bit? Yeah, uh, obviously that's a fun little scene. It's 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 a you know sort of a little bit of a comedic break from the horrible thing he just did, yeah. killing his mother. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah. Needed um, that break. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, brilliantly put together by Todd in, in constructing that. You need those tension and breaks and, yeah. you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, you know, again, uh, as this is happens quite a lot in this movie, is that scene starts very grounded in reality. Everything is very real. Um you know, there's the details of the TV, you know, physically panning off as he's, we're focused on him on the couch and whatever. And then as he starts to go into his play acting of, of being on the show, as we get towards the end, the show sort of seems to come alive out, put the audience outside in of the, the, room, in the real room world, him. you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it always keeps you guessing as to what's real and what's not. And I, I think that's one of the geniuses of the movie is that the movie ends, you walk out of the theater and, and it's gonna take you a while to really decide what really happened <laughs> and what was real and what wasn't real. And there's certain things that you're told this is real or isn't real. But then there's a lot of stuff. I mean, we mixed the movie for months and months later amongst ourselves are arguing over whether or not this is real and whether or not that person really did this or, you know, so yeah. I think that's, you know, that's the stuff that makes the movie haunt you, that that's makes right. it stick with you. And, and it's going to make it stand the test of time. And, I think. and rewards repeat viewing and it makes you want to oh come back. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we have a little Easter eggs. I don't know. Do you see the, uh, the super rats. And there's two scenes that super rats travel what, what's, by. What is a su the no. super rat? The because they the big rat. The big, the big yeah. rat. That's a, that's a running. That's a running thing in the film. Is these rats that are taking right. over Gotham right. City, right? So yeah. yeah, we even have. There's a few places a where you places see them where, scurrying around, but they're not yeah. obvious, which is great. Yeah. And so yeah. if you see it, you see it. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. You know, obviously, you you three are up for the Academy Award, but you weren't the only three who contributed to the soundtrack on this film. I'm sure. You know, Absolutely. mixed techs, yeah. sound editors, yeah. Foley people. You guys had an, had an army behind you, right? Yeah. And and the, one of the nicest compliments we got was when Arthur was in the girlfriend's apartment and she hadn't gotten there yet and the rain's falling and it's an eerie scene. He runs his hand over the child's uh, uh, Art, her, artwork, painting, artwork yeah. her, her painting. And the texture that one step up, Dan O'Connell and John Cucci came up with as his hand moved across this child's painting was so eerie and so macabre. And then we had people in the audience bring that bring that up. It was like, yeah, it gave them shivers just hearing that. So, yeah, it, it, we had an incredible team and everybody brought their A game. I mean, the cinematography on this movie is well. Incredible. The cinematography is is stunning. Yeah, yeah. At, at every at each one of the departments was really just doing superb work. On yeah, this. production design and Joaquin. We're all sitting there every day, mesmerized by his performance. It was yeah. like, oh my god, incredible. So, 
And we had a great, you, you brought up the mix tech. I got a compliment. Unsun was a, yeah. she was, Unsun Song, she was our mix tech. She did a great job just managing the, the, the particulars of the stage. And one funny story though, we're mixing the scene where the audience starts to figure out we can't she, trust she it. wasn't real. She wasn't right? real. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. And Unsana, we have an untrustworthy narrator here. Yeah. Unsung is standing there, and, she, and we're we're mixing this in. And she goes, "Oh, <laughs> just like oh," and it just caught. And that was the best because we knew the audience was going to have that same reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they found out that she wasn't really in the hospital room, right. she wasn't standing behind him. Uh, it was fun, and then. Uh, John Thomas, our effects editor slash stage editor, Stand, uh, outstanding work, and Kira. Kira for dialogue. Yeah, big shout out to Kira Rossler, yeah. was the dialogue supervisor and did all the dialogue work and ADR work, and she's awesome. She was with us on Star is Born also. Yeah. Now, also was Jason Reuter on the music side, music, you know, supervising music editor and on both shows, and he's the best. You know, I mean, it's just we wouldn't be able to, you know, claim the victories we've had without them. So that's great. Well, thank you guys so much for making the time to, to to do the show and talk with us about about this film. It's pretty, you know, I can't say it's a, a feel good, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a feel good, uplifting about life film. But it's it's um, it's it's a very, I think, uh uh, yeah. inter interesting statement on our times as yes. well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Sticks a really, really, with you. Yeah, and a really powerful film and just extraordinary work uh, from all of you guys. Thank Alan, you. Tom, Dean. Thank you. Congratulations on your nominations. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and thanks for talking with us about it. Hello and welcome to the second part of our conversation on Joker. Uh, we talked earlier with uh, uh, the post-production sound team, but I'm happy to be here today talking with Todd Maitland, who is the production sound mixer on the show. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've had a busy year. Not only did you do Joker, but you also were the production sound mixer on another little another little New York movie this year called The Irishman. Yes, it was another little movie that was actually done two years ago because they ah. did a year and a half of post on it. So it seems like it was just yesterday, but it was really like two years ago. But yeah, Understood. but another great and another really good one for production sound mixer too, because tons of dialogue you know and period cars and all of the kind of stuff that i like to deal with as i'm, I'm sure and uh, you know it's of course no 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 small thing that both of your movies are up for for best picture which is fantastic yeah so, so uh, we heard from uh, alan murray and dean and tom about some of the challenges that they faced in 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 uh building out the sound effects of joker and and mixing the film but i'd i'd, I'd love to hear your take on uh, you know, what was your first reaction when you read the script and sort of understood the uh, what what uh, director Todd Phillips was trying to do and, and trying to build this very dirty, gritty, uh, you know, kind of 1970s New York style environment in Gotham City? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that really appealed to me is I really cut my teeth on New York movies. You know, if you think about it, 1980s were really Pacino, De Niro, Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. Those are all like the gritty dramas, you know, that I really that's where I learned my craft, you know, and that back then you really had a mix because you only had a stereo nagro. So everything was going to those two tracks. So if you didn't open up the right fader at the right moment, you missed it. It wasn't going on that tape. So. Um, so this movie truly appealed to me. And in my conversations with Todd, that he said that's exactly what we're doing. He said, you know, we basically kind of tricked Warner Brothers into making a drama, you know, right. when they thought they were making a superhero movie. Um, so in reading through it, you know, anytime you do something, period, you want to really try to capture the environment as much as you can. And this movie, obviously, every scene, the streets are wet, there's garbage everywhere, there's noise everywhere. But you know, when you're filming nowadays and you're trying to create 1980, there's a lot of sound that you don't want. Right. You know, so you really try to focus on on like the vehicles that they bring in for this for the scenes. You know, so we had all these, you know, 70s and 80s cars or 80 car. Um, and, you know, so I, I build a little library of all those sound effects and and then try to find like the old subway cars like we did a whole scene on the subway. So 
I went out after the movie was finished. I went out with a VR mic and spent a week recording every area that we had filmed in for the movie. And I spent a lot of time on the subways. So I tried to go out, you know, at, at yeah. like two in the morning. That's amazing. Well, I, I wanted to dig into that a little bit because obviously the subway sequence is really uh, that's a that's a pivotal turning film point in the film when you know Arthur Fleck kind of becomes Joker at, at that point through through what happens in that scene. And I'm presuming was that all was that all on on a set? That was all on a set. Okay. It was it was yeah. So well I, done set. Sure. Obviously, it looked fantastic, but you're not getting you're not getting the the authentic feel of the sound of the New York subway system then. So so you're saying that you went out uh, so. Um, Alan Murray said that you went out with an ambisonic rig and did a whole bunch of, of um, kind of 360 audio recording. Can you tell us a little bit exactly. about that? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, just for the movie, I mean, it was actually a blessing that we filmed on stage because we have that part where one of one of the Wall Street guys is singing as he comes towards him. Yes. We have all their dialogue in that. If we were doing that on a real subway car, it would have been very difficult to capture the sound the way we wanted it because they weren't everything was really kind of lower in volume, you know, until that moment happened, right. you know? Right. So, you know, pretty much throughout the movie, actually, everything through the whole beginning of it, you know, and in post-production, they did a great job because they really held back from trying to push anything, you know? So the beginning of it is very real. You know, the sounds of the tenement and all of that is, they're all subtle, but they're all very real. And then when you do get to that subway, you know, that's when everything builds. So since we did do it on a set with all of these light screens on, on each side of the set, um, um, we obviously needed great, you know, a great train track to go along yeah. with that. Yeah. So I went out with the ambisonic rig after the movie was over. And if on the, in the film, you see there's nobody on the cars. So mm -hmm. I needed to find empty subway cars. And in New York, the only time you can do that is like, you know, <laughs> is between two, in the morning? two and the five in the morning, yeah. you know. So I would go out between two and five in the morning and I would just get all different perspectives, you know, inside the car, in between the cars, trying to get it as it went from from an exterior into a tunnel because that happens in the scene. Sure. And um, so, yeah, just, just giving those guys as much as I possibly could, you know, in effects for that. So. And what, what was the, what was the thinking behind? Why did it need to be an ambisonics rig as opposed to just a mono kind of mic source? What did that, what did that uh, kind of uh, accomplish for you? Well, I think what they want is to be able, I mean, that's four mic elements, basically. So now you're dealing with a full 360 sound. Mm -hmm. So to be able to play with that 360 sound, uh, you know, is, is what they wanted for post, which I totally get. I mean, when I do scenes, I always have two or three ambient mics going, mm -hmm. particularly if we're doing anything where there's car drive-bys or any of that. I always have extra ambient mics. And I think that that's one of the things that actually really plays well with Dolby because because you have these extra microphones now that you can start to play with, you know, and put them in different places, you know, with, you know, with the Atmos system, it's yeah. pretty great. Yeah. Now I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I haven't ha had this conversation with another production sound mixer, but <clears throat> what I was going to ask you is, um, does knowing that the film is going to be ultimately mixed in Dolby Atmos, does that affect at all the way you're miking or handling sound from a, a production standpoint? You know, I, it should. Yeah. Um, and, um, one of the things that I have in my, in my history is that I was one of the founders of the Hollywood edge sound library. Sure. So I spent a lot of time recording sound effects and back in the Oliver Stone days, back in the talk radio, born on the 4th of July, JFK and the doors, right. I used to be in on post-production also. So I learned a lot about what post-production really needs and learned that by using as many ambient mics as I could really gives them the chance to open up the background and open up the scene and make it right. as real as possible. Right. So I've been doing this, you know, since multi-track came around, I've been, I've been recording like this. But what I think is that I think is that so many mixers should be doing this and yeah. I don't know you know, whether they do or not. And that's, that's something I have no idea, but I, I do believe that, you know, again, particularly for scenes where you have things happening in the background, you know, and, and I keep bringing up the period cars because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that really does kind of timestamp a movie, you that's know, right. for, for, you know, that period, um, and sirens and things like that, you know, all of those things are what, you know, you think about when you think of 1980, because it's a very different sound than it is now. Right. You know, it's the old muscle cars and 
you know, everything's quieter now. <laughs> well, the city's not quieter, but <laughs> yeah, back then they had. Well, now now they have. You have cars you can't even hear. So right, exactly. Yeah, very very different. Add, add sound to them now. Well, tell me a little bit more about what was your. You, you said you were you had experience on the post production side uh, on on those earlier films. What were you doing? Were you were you cutting sound effects or what? What were you no. doing? I was basically sitting in and and uh, with Wiley Stateman and Lon Bender for Sound Deluxe and oh. just kind of sitting in with them and we would just all talk about it. Physically, I wasn't doing anything other than gathering sound effects right. you know, when, when we would need them. So I would go back out into the field and grab, grab whatever we needed. But but I actually got to sit in on those. Oliver wanted me there, so it was really nice. Um, well, that's fantastic. So, you know, this is something that, you know, uh, you know, my, I've spent my career in, in post-production sound and we all, you know, I, I, I've heard it said many times on the dev stage, I wish that guy who recorded the tracks on set was here to hear what, you know, to hear what yeah. we're having to deal with. So I'm really curious for you to just uh, kind of maybe d uh, dig a little deeper into that experience that you had on the mixing stage with Lon and Wiley and Soundlux and, and on those Oliver Stone films. How, can you tell me a little bit more about how that changed your approach to recording on set? Absolutely. Now, as... Because when you when you see it on a screen, so I, I came from the days of dailies, you know, we used to sure. do dailies, you know, the day after you film something, every all the heads of the department would go and see that on screen. And for me, that was instrumental in my mixing because I got to see and hear right. how each scene sounded while it was still fresh. And then if you stay, if you're on a scene for, say, five days in a row on the second day, you could go there and see it. And you say, okay, well, maybe I don't love the way the room is sounding, you know, and I right. can just kind of, you know, mold it a little bit better in different directions. So when when you're watching a film on screen, it's entirely different from listening to headphones and watching a monitor. Yeah. And um, that experience there, you know, really showed me how how instrumental it is to have all of these sound effects. I mean, I remember I, I, I was listening to a podcast with um, Skip Levsky, and he did a movie where they didn't have any soundtrack. So mm -hmm. he had to build the soundtrack from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Ambiences, you know, every single Foley thing and every ambient, you know, he had a, every ambient sound he had to build. And he said it was an absolute nightmare and the sound just never was great. Yeah. You know, so kn knowing, you know, that's that happened just recently, but, but back in those days, you know, I really got to see how everything that I recorded, you know, like on Born on the Fourth of July, we did these parade scenes and then all the war scenes sure. and all of that. So everything that I could grab, you know, and I, and I like to plant microphones. So I'll put microphones all over the place and I'll label them on my metadata and just say, you know, microphone over by this bomb over here, you know, <laughs> or people running by here or whatever. But it, they're just snippets of things, but they're real. You know, yeah. they're actually, they're the real thing that's happening. And I think that it's always great if you can give the real thing, you know, to recreate something you, you you know it sometimes, you know? I go one of the movies and I go, okay, they totally redid that. It feels different, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So how many, just, if you're shooting, I'm thinking about, you know, some of the, uh, th those sequences uh, outside with Arthur early on in the film when he's doing a sign thing. Just give me kind of a typical, what's a typical day for you when that's the kind of setup? How many microphones are you using? Kind of what's the setup? Walk us right. through something like that. But I would always, I would always wire Joaquin because he would breathe or he would make little lip smacks or, and he was very soft spoken in the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. Arthur Fleck, you know, was, was, you know, kind of a demure kind of, you know, slightly disturbed. So he was in his own world. So he made these little sounds, you know, so I would always have a microphone on him. Then mm -hmm. I would always boom him also, um, which is just my general practice anyway, because yeah. I just like the sound of booms better than I do wires. I always hope that the boom is going to sound better than the wire. But in this instance, since his sounds were so subtle, the wireless really was was great with him. Mm -hmm. And then whenever he's walking in the street, like up those stairs, I would have a microphone, you know, in the middle of the stairs. I'd have one at the bottom of the stairs and one at the top of the stairs. And then him wired so you could hear him breathing as he's, sure. you know, lugging up those stairs each time. Yeah. So I'd always would have about three ambient, ambient mics. That's my average, average um, scene. And the other reason I do that, the reason I started that, besides learning from the Oliver Stone days, was that if you have an ambient mic going and a plane goes overhead mm -hmm. um, and the director loved that scene, you know, now they have to recreate that plane. 
that exact plane to try to now carry over for the next piece of coverage. So if they love the shot of one I person, see. Right, you have right, a plane right. going over. Now when you go back to the other person, there's no plane there's going no over. Plane, so now sure. they have to bring in a, a different plane and try to make it sound like it's match so, it. Yeah. So if I have this ambient mic going and and just grabbing everything that's going around, all they have to do is now add in that ambient track onto the other person's dialogue and it completes the scene. Right, right. The plane that we thought ruined the take. Actually, you, is were, now you, were, you were able to save it. <laughs> right. On JFK, actually, we filmed this giant scene with um, Donald Sutherland mm -hmm. as they're walking around talking. You know, he, he and... Um, um, Kevin Costner, right? Kevin Costner, right. As yeah. they're walking around talking, it was an eight-minute scene, and we were right in, right in Washington. At that point, planes flew right overhead. Mm -hmm. So we had two planes that would fly over every single scene. So talking to Oliver and Bob Richardson... We said, look, let's make this part of it, you know, because it yeah. really kind of annihilates the dialogue. So their dialogue has to come up in volume naturally. You know, when they're talking, they actually had to bring their volume up to hear each other. So Bob Richardson would pant, go up to the camera, up to the plane, take a sure. shot of the plane and then, and then come back down, down to it. Yeah. Right. And Donald Sutherland would look up to it, you know, and just so now you know that it's there. Yeah. That's one of the things that I always say, like. In New York, New York has sound everywhere. It sure and if you, does. Yeah. If the sound is justified, if you see it. So, for instance, if you're shooting next to a construction site, so if the camera is facing the construction site and you see it, then it's totally fine to have all of that noise. But if the camera is the other direction and nobody knows there's a construction site right across the street, now you have a real problem with it. So right. it's the justification of sound, you know, and dealing in New York, you do that a lot. You know, there's a lot of sound everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's that's conceptually brilliant, you know, showing the plane and then you've got the justification for the sound being there. That's really fascinating. Right. Yeah. 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 So that that actually that was probably where I learned, you know, to always keep something open, you know, to give them that extra sound, whatever happens, because it happens all the time. It can be a truck. It can be a plane. It can be, you know, it can be kids yelling. You know, it can be anything, you know, but it, it, at yeah. least now post production has that exact same sound that they can use for, you know, the other side of the conversation. Yeah. So when, when we were talking earlier at the beginning, you, 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 uh, you were made mention of, you know, the role of the production sound mixer was in some ways harder because you had to wedge everything down into a two track Niagara recording. So obviously that, you know, that particular limitation has gone, but you know, you don't want to just hand off to picture editorial 25, you know, 20, 25 plus tracks of, of, right. of, of wide open stuff. So, so you're still mixing, but what do you, what do you typically hand over to picture editorial now? And how do you, how do you approach that? So I always, I still mix the way that I always have. I still mix for dailies. My father was a sound mixer. Mm -hmm. Um, and he always said you live and die by dailies and you really do. I mean, cause in dailies, you know, what you heard was really what was there, you know, it, you, it, there was nothing else, you know, well, you nothing do, else to go to. As the sound mixer, you do live and die by dailies because if they don't like what they're hearing, you're getting fired, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And it's like the next day. So you yeah. really, when you go to dailies, you know, if you knew you had a problem seeing, you know, you, you'd be nervous going to dailies and then you'd have to have a conversation and figure it all out and all of that. So, yeah. um, so, um, so are you still mixing down to a, a mono track to hand over to Picture Editorial? I do. I do. Track number one is a mono track, and then my booms are ISO tracks after that. So I usually have two booms going all the time, and then um, ambient tracks, and then wireless tracks. So now you know it's we can do up to forty eight tracks. Right. I mean the system the system that I have now I have you know twenty four wirelesses and and I can do things all over the place now. So, but giving that flexibility, you know, because they'll go back in, you know, pull out whatever they want from the ISOs. Sure. But it is that mix track that is what the director hears the next day, you know, when he's looking at it with the editors, you know, since they don't do dailies anymore. Right. Although every once in a while, like I just did West Side Story and Spielberg would do dailies once a week for heads of department, which Re was reviewing, great. Reviewing all the material? Or was that just selects at that point? Selects. Sure. Selects. It was like two hours of selects on a Saturday. That's amazing. Know? Yeah, that must have been a lot it of. It was worth it. That must have, it must have been a lot of fun to be in that room. Yeah, it was great to be in that room. You know, because you get to see everything develop, and it's you get to see the whole week. You know, I mean, I used to love it every day because again, it would 
afford me that opportunity to make any changes that I, that I needed. Yeah. But even still, just doing it for that one week, and since the system that I used on that film was a new system for me, it, it gave me that opportunity to hear it on a screen yeah. as opposed to my headphones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, while we've got you, um, what uh, I'm curious just to ask you sort of similar questions about The Irishman. What were some of the, what were the biggest challenges for you working on on the Irishman, there's a particular scene that I want to ask you about, but uh, I'm curious to hear what you say. Um, you know, the biggest challenge on that was just it's just dialogue everywhere. It's, um, it's a very dialogue intensive film. Of dialogue. Yeah. The, the 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 part that that was that made it um, that allowed me to get really great quality sound is that Marty likes to shoot with one camera predominantly. Uh -huh. So I'd say probably 70% of the time we would use one camera. And, and that, allows you to use, that, that allows you to get a boom in there, right? Usually. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Because what happens now is, you know, directors will shoot with two or three cameras. One might be on a hundred on a close up, and one might be on a 20 on a wide shot. So now you're committing to a wireless sound. Right. you know, on that close up actor. And that may not even be the best shot for them because they're still going to go back in and cover them, you know, with on their, on their coverage later on. Right. So, and Rodrigo Pietro is really good about working out, you know, the boom shot, boom shadows and everything else, you mm -hmm. know? So I was really able to do some really good boom work in there. And for me, that just adds the depth and the sound, you know, of a room. It adds life to it. Um, as I said, I just, you know, most every mixer loves the sound of a boom as, you know, over a lav. Of course, yeah. Just the way it is. Um, but um, so I'd say the biggest challenges were really, the, you know, the heavy dialogue with those guys. And one of the things that I ended up doing was actually working with, with De Niro on his voice for his older, for his older character. Yeah. So, because they needed to go from younger people right. to older people, so not only do they needed to, you know, change their the way they walk and the way they hold themselves, but they needed to change their cadence, their breathing, mm -hmm. the amount of energy that's in their voice. So I kind of became that person who, who really was on and off, list, you know, like trying to keep them in their age category. Yeah, you know? and and it's it's not natural for you know, for actors to, you know, to go back and forth like that. So Bob would do a scene when he's younger and then he would go to his 80, 80 year old scene. And it's just a very, very different cadence. And well, I, yeah, I'd love to hear you just uh, describe that in a little bit more detail, because obviously, you know, people have paid a lot of attention to the visual effects of the de-aging. Um, but uh, tell me a little bit more about how you work with an actor to age his or her voice up and down. I did. Well, when we did, um, for Bob, he did all of the narration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the film starts, you know, you come in on him and he's in the old age home. And right. then really it's his, all the narration that happens after that. So I sat in the recording room with them for about a week while we did all of that. And I, and after each take, Bob would say, you know, anything. And I'd say, well, I would slow it down a little bit, add a little more breathing, be a little more breathy. Because you, you, get, you get more breathy as you get older. You do, yeah. You just you do, your vocal cords don't work in the same way. You have to push a little bit. You don't have as much air to push, right? First of all, so you have to breathe more often. Right. Um, and the level and the tone and the energy of your voice, you know, comes down. Mm -hmm. So it would be always trying to keep Bob slow Bob down, you know, because <laughs> he doesn't want to be old. It was funny. We did one scene where, in the movie, where he's he's old at this point and he's walking with a cane and he stumbles in his house and falls down. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they said rap, Bob would jump back up. Like he would like spring back up on his feet. Yeah. And it was like, not me, like, not me. I want to be <laughs> that person. And I, I don't blame him. I understand it, but he would always kind of break out of that and try to and get back to that younger voice. So I'd have to walk over to him in the middle of the scene and go, Bob, just you know, be a little more quiet, yeah. slow it down a little. It's like, okay, good, good, good. That's <laughs> Thanks, great. Tom. That's great. Well, yeah. I, I had the I had the opportunity to um, I sat down with uh, Eugene Garrity and Tom Fleischman a month or so ago and talked about oh, about the their, their work on the post production side of the Irishman. We talked we spent quite a bit of time talking about the scene between Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro when they're in the Howard Johnsons having breakfast, right? Uh, and Joe Pesci basically breaks the news to uh, uh, right. that he's going to go you know hit uh, hit uh, 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 Jimmy Hoffa, and yeah. uh, you know it it's a really powerful scene. I think because there's no music in it, because there's almost no sound effect, it's really just a very quiet atmosphere and their voices. And as as Tommy 
uh, cereal Fleischmann, boxes. As Tommy Fletcher pointed out, <laughs> yeah, Joe Pesci munching cereal through the whole thing. So yeah, that 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 uh, that scene. Uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in the film, but it certainly gave them a lot. Yeah. Of, they had to do uh, a lot of fun work on it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it comes down to that point. Really, just getting you know, getting the dialogue as clean as you can. You sure. know, a lot of my job is to really capture the components individually as clean as you can get them you know right. every voice as clean as you can get it every sound effect as clean as you can get it you know because then you can build with the components but if they're dirty to begin with and and post-production has to start now trying to extract things to really capture what they're looking for you know then it makes everybody's job you know much more difficult and the final product is not as good that's right that's right well, obviously, you know, you had the Oscar nomination as the head of the as the head of the department, but you were not out there recording all this stuff on your own. Uh, tell yep. us, give us, give us a, give, tell us about your team, your boom uh, operator, and and who, whoever else might have been on your team with you on Joker. Yeah, I I've been lucky because I've had the same team with me for probably almost twenty years now. So I have my boom man who's been with me. Um, who now lives in Arizona, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and that's Mike Scott, and then Jerry Ewan, who's like my right-hand man for everything. You know, I was actually offered to do the Hobbit movies, mm -hmm. and I said I won't go without Jerry, and <laughs> immigration for New Zealand would not allow me to bring another person, so I ended up turning it down. Wow. You know, it's So he's really kind of my right-hand man. And now... My nephew, Terrence, who is now third generation, um, so he came on. He did Irishman with us, mm -hmm. and now he's booming, and, and, and he also did West Side Story with us, too. So he's now becoming a part of the whole team. So it's to be able to have you know the same team makes life so much easier. Anytime I've had to travel and bring in an extra third from a local third or whatever, it just makes everything so difficult because you need to now retrain them for everything that you do, you know, and things that my guys know to do truly that I don't have to think about. Now you have to think about another person's job, you yeah. know, so it just changes your whole timing and how you deal with things. Yeah. Well, and, you know, production on set is a very stressful environment and nobody wants to wait around for people to be mic'd up and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And that's the new thing now is that everybody... Post wants everybody wired. You know, I came from the world of booming and I actually wouldn't wire people because I knew if I could get a better sound on a boom, I didn't want to give them the option of having the wireless sound sure. sometimes because yeah. I know that sometimes they're just going to go to it because it's easier or whatever. Yeah. But I, but the sound that we really wanted for that moment was really on a boom. So, but now you really pretty much wire everybody all the time, you know, and and I understand it, you know, it just gives you more options. It's good know? to have options. And options. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have options in life and in sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, Todd, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been really fun uh, hearing about, uh, yeah, hearing about no, Joker. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. All right, everyone, That's uh, that wraps up our conversation on Joker. We talked with um, the uh, post-production sound team earlier with Alan Murray and, and Dean Sapanzik and, and, and uh, Tom, and now we've uh, just wrapped up with uh, Todd Maitland uh, talking about the production sound. Uh, congratulations on the nomination, and thanks again. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. <laughs>